Uh, good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Alex White and Director General here at the Institute, and you're all uh, very welcome. I say that on my own behalf and on behalf of our Chairman, Fergal O'Rourke, who's um, back there, back in the room. And um, it's great to see you all here. And it's my great pleasure to just briefly introduce this event. Our very distinguished um, speaker, Willie Walsh, who's more than welcome to the Institute here, and Fergal McNamara, the other Fergal will say more about Willie in a minute uh, when, when the proceedings get underway. So uh, thank you all for your at attendance. And actually, Fergal McNamara, who's the co-chair with Owen Lewis of our Climate and Energy Group here at the Institute, has been doing great work for us on this overall a question on overall area and agenda of aviation. We had a very successful event back in June, uh, uh, also on sustainable aviation. So this is kind of part of a, of a mini series, um, but it's a particular um, uh, honor for us here to have, um, as I said, such a distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Willie Walsh, we all know, uh, I'm sure from his time here in Ireland at the head of our lingus and subsequently head of IAG, and is now Director General of the International Airlines, International Airline Travel Association. I hope I have that correct. Air Transport Association. And you know, you, everywhere you go, you see IATA, you know, but you, you know, so anyway, he's the guy, as you know. So very welcome. Uh, you're all very welcome. He's is particularly welcome. And I hand you over now to Fergal McNamara to uh, host this fireside chat with Willie Walsh. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, and we're delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon by Willie Walsh, the Director General of IATA, the International Air Transport Association, who I will introduce to you uh, properly in, uh, in a few moments. But at the end of uh, this conversation this afternoon, I hope you'll come away knowing more about the industry, its ambition for net zero, uh, some of the technology uh, that, that are coming down the track, issues with uh, capacity in the system, uh, issues with uh, supply chains, and in general, to know more about the aviation industry. And Willie is going to uh, have a fireside chat with us to, to go through all of that. But first, I must go through a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, this session is on the record and is being uh, recorded. Uh, if you're using X, uh, would you be kind enough to tag us at IIEA and uh, join the conversation that way? Uh, we have many people on, on online. Uh, for those of you online, you can join the conversation uh, by entering your comments or questions on the Q&A function in Zoom. And please uh, do that as soon as, you, uh, as soon as it occurs to you so that I can try to get to it and put them to uh, Willie as we go along. For you in the room, uh, you can also join the conversation uh, by raising your hand and we'll get a mic to you and wait for the mic because the people online need to hear the question as well. Uh, tell us your name and uh, tell us your affiliation uh, when you're putting a question. And I'll probably, given the crowd that's here, uh, stack the questions in two or three and, and pass them along to, to, to Willie. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Willie Walsh to you. Uh, Willie is the eighth uh, person to lead uh, IATA. Uh, uh, he was there since 2021. He is there since 2021. Uh, previously, he'd been on the board and also served as the chair of the organization. Uh, before that, you'll uh, know him to have been the chief executive of International Airlines Group, which included BA and Iberia, a merger that he oversaw and saw that unit through the COVID-19 crisis and through the great financial crisis. And we will know Willie very well as uh, chief executive of Aer Lingus until to, uh, from 1979 when you joined as a cadet pilot to uh, 2005. And you're a Dubliner, you're welcome home. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Willie Walsh. The well. and the north and, 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 and the north sider as well um so uh, we're, we're going to start with a fireside conversation and i'm going to put a few uh, questions to willie and then uh, hand it over to you and we can take it to wherever your interests lie uh, and we are by the fireside in this lovely house um so willie can i start by asking you uh, what are the issues that are preoccupying you your members the industry what you're seeing around the world uh, what are the hot topics that are coming down the horizon, and uh, what, what where, where do you see uh, where do you see the future going for the industry? Yeah, I think the uh, the positive for the industry is that we've recovered uh, pretty strongly from the COVID crisis uh, globally. If I look at uh, for the first eight months of this year compared to 2019, we're about uh, three percent ahead of where we were. Now there are some significant regional uh, differences. Uh, the Asia Pacific region is still slowly recovering. Uh, international travel 
uh, from within the Asia Pacific region and into and out of the Asia Pacific region is still about 11% down on where it was in 2019. And that's principally around China and it's being heavily impacted by geopolitical issues. So flights between the US and China are only at about 30% of where they were in uh, 2019. There are no flights between India and China uh, at the moment, which I have to say I find uh, very surprising. So, uh, you know, although the industry has recovered, the geopolitical environment is impacting on the pace of recovery and also the, if you like, the, the future direction. So we have the impact of the war in Ukraine, uh, which uh, is having a major problem for European and Asian carriers uh, and to some degree North American carriers because Russian airspace is now closed to most airlines. So it means flying between Europe and Asia, you have to take a, a much longer uh, route, adding about two to four hours flying time. So that's resulted in a number of European carriers um, suspending their flights uh, into China because of the uh, additional cost and impact that it's having on their network. Uh, it also, you know, the war also had a big impact on the price of oil initially, although that's uh, subsided significantly uh, over the, the, the past uh, couple of months. And then you have uh, what's happening in the Middle East. Um, so that's having a significant impact there, not just on the region itself uh, with the uh, carriers directly being impacted, but it's also uh, on some of the, uh, the, the uh, neighboring countries it's impacting particularly in tourism, places like Egypt. Uh, and then we've had uh, significant airspace closures because of the uh, Iranian attack on Israel and um, the, the risk of retaliation. So uh, the geopolitical environment um, always has an impact on our industry, but it's having a much more significant impact uh, during the past probably uh, three years than I've witnessed in my previous 40, 42 years in the industry. Uh, but you know the, the the underlying message is the industry is uh, recovering well. Demand for aviation is very strong, even with all of the uh, issues impacting. Uh, demand uh, con continues to be very strong, and the the number one item on the the agenda for all airlines uh, is the environmental impact. Uh, it's you know I've described it as an existential issue. Um, our industry has been described as difficult to abate. Uh, I think that's an understatement um, because uh, you know we do have a path to net zero in 2050, but it's very complex, it's very challenging, and it's extremely expensive. Uh, so although we can identify how we'll get there, uh, I think there is growing concern about the, uh, the cost associated with the transition to net zero and the impact that that will have on the industry as well. But it's still the, it's the number one issue with every air, airline CEO that I talk to. Lots of other things, but yeah, that, it's good start. That, that's the, the, the sort of the, the, the quick uh, yeah. view on what's happening. That's a great start, Willie. Thank you very much for all that. Uh, it's very surprising some of those things about no flights between India and, uh, yeah. and China and China and the US is quite, quite surprising, but in, in, in the fullest time that'll probably come back and uh, uh, feed some demand. But you mentioned the, the number one question about the environment. So we'll probably peel that onion a little bit together and s see how it goes. I mean, both your organization and IKO, the governments together have made the pledge for net zero by 2050 along with lots of other sectors and you mentioned you're hard to abate and you're often put in the same box with the maritime sector uh, but you have uh, produced uh, first of all you had a clear goal and second of all you've produced these pathway papers with concrete milestones for for for, for the way that that, that that it'll all happen and if I read it right uh, SAF is a big workhorse of this transition for you accounting for about two-thirds of the effort followed very closely by offsetting carbon offsetting and then there's technology and efficiency uh, and I think you mentioned before that that all the stakeholders have to put throw their shoulders to the wheel a little bit. But the the the, uh, the stats are quite striking. Uh, first of all, you have a two times growth in the uh, air air transport. The SAF is anything two x to five x, mm -hmm. uh, although we don't know the price very well. And the quantity of SAF that you need is something like fifty x. Yeah. So I just wonder if you had to pick pick apart some of those pieces and uh, and and discuss. Yes, yeah, so uh, about two years ago, the industry uh, committed to achieving net zero in 2050. We had previously had a target of a 50% net reduction by 2050, but we recognized that we were 
uh, no longer aligned with the, the science and particularly with the, the Paris Agreement. So uh, we came together. Um, importantly, we identified that there was a path that could get us to net zero because uh, when we committed to the 50% net reduction back in 2009, I don't think we gave proper consideration as to how we would get there. So uh, you know, we've mapped out um, within IATA a pathway to net zero. There are a number of organizations who have also mapped it out. The thing that's consistent with all of them is the dependence on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, now, sustainable aviation fuel uh, is important to us because it's what we call a drop-in fuel. So it can be used with the aircraft that we have in service today, uh, and it requires no investment in infrastructure at the airports. Uh, now, why is it important that we can use it with the aircraft that's in service today? Because the aircraft that we're flying today will be flying uh, in 25 years. An aircraft that's bought tomorrow will still be flying in at least 25 years. And there are no new aircraft being designed, uh, particularly for medium to long haul flying. So there's nothing from a technological point of view that's going to assist us uh, in getting to net zero in terms of a radical change in the design of the aircraft. So sustainable aviation fuel uh, uh, can uh, achieve about 65% of the abatement that uh, we're aiming for in 2050. Uh, the problem is it's being produced in very low quantities at the moment, uh, and we need significant scaling up of uh, the production of sustainable fuel. Most of the fuel that's being produced is being produced in the United States, uh, the industry there got a huge boost under the Inflation Reduction Act, where there's significant uh, financial incentive to invest in the production of sustainable fuel. So the US is leading the way. There's very little activity in Europe. Um, and in fact, there's no sustainable aviation fuel being developed in Africa or in Latin America. So it's principally the US, followed by uh, the EU, followed by places like Singapore. Uh, but most of it is being developed in the United States. So what we're saying is, you know, we need to have governments come together to create a policy framework that will incentivize production in SAF. Uh, we're not asking for anything special because what we're saying is if you look at how we've made the transition to clean energy with wind and solar, that didn't happen without you know, government intervention and government incentives. So what we're saying is we need the same sort of approach to ensure that we can get there for uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and important to point out, sustainable aviation fuel will be used for uh, you know, the aviation industry, but it will also produce sustainable fuel that can be used for other industries as well. So you know, a refinery that's producing sustainable aviation fuel about 45 to 50% of the output would go to aviation. The rest of it would go to, could go to road transport. It could go to the chemical industry. So it's not just about aviation. You know, obviously, we're labeling it a sustainable aviation fuel, but it can be used for other sources as well. And in terms of cost, uh, we just produced a paper um, a couple of weeks ago, and it's identified that the cost of transition, uh, the differential between what we believe kerosene will cost and what SAF will cost will be about 4.7 trillion US dollars. Uh, so it would average 174 billion US dollars a year if it was evenly distributed between now and, and 2050. And to put that into context, 174 billion of additional cost for an industry that uh, uh, this year is expected to make about 30 billion uh, US dollars. So it's a huge increase in cost. Uh, fuel today is our single biggest cost base, uh, our cost in our cost base. Um, this would increase the percentage of our costs accounted for by fuel to about 41, 42% of our cost base. Uh, so, um, you know, what I've been saying is there's no way the industry can absorb this. You know, people say, well, who's going to pay for this transition? And it's absolutely clear the consumer ultimately is going to have to pay uh, because airlines do not have the financial scope to absorb that additional cost. Uh, so that's why I say it's going to be challenging. Um, it's going to be very expensive, and it will have a, an impact on you know, the future growth of the industry as well.
That's very, very interesting, very stark. Uh, Willie, thank you very much for that. Um, maybe I could just come back on SAF in a few minutes, but could I ask you just to have a wander through the other areas, the offsetting, the carbon offsetting, mm -hmm. uh, the operational efficiencies, where do you see those? And, and technologies, we, we have heard of, but you just said there are no new aircraft on the books, but we've heard a lot about hybrid, electric, electric and hydrogen, all means of propulsion, uh, the single skies, uh, efficiencies in the airport and so on. Yeah. You know, yeah, we're looking at everything. Uh, so just to touch on technology, uh, hydrogen will play a part at some stage. But quite honestly, my personal view is it's going to be the major impact of hydrogen is going to be beyond 2050. So when we looked at the pathway to net zero in 2050, we haven't put a lot of emphasis on hydrogen. Uh, the, the big challenge with hydrogen, of course, is for it to be effective, it has to be green hydrogen. And there's still very, very little if, if you know, practically no volume of uh, green hydrogen being produced. So hydrogen will play a part. Now, hydrogen would require a fundamental redesign of the aircraft if it was to be a hydrogen-powered aircraft. It would also require massive uh, infrastructure investment at airports. Uh, so the transition costs, if we were to depend on hydrogen, uh, if it was available, would be even greater than the uh, costs that I've identified there. But the real challenge is we will not have a hydrogen powered aircraft in service in any scale uh, before 2040 or 2050. Uh, Airbus is the only manufacturer currently talking about a hydrogen powered aircraft. They're talking about an, an aircraft coming into service in 2035. Uh, if you think of it, there's 33,000 jet transport aircraft in service today. Um, you know, Air Airbus would need to produce a hell of a lot of airplanes in a very short period of time for it to be effective by 2050. So it, it will play a part, um, but not a significant part. And hybrid, electric and electric, uh, all the production in this area, which is going to be fascinating, is really in small aircraft and short distances. Uh, so if you look at how the industry produces CO2, about 80% of the CO2 produced by the industry uh, comes from flights of greater than 1,500 kilometers. We're not going to have a hybrid, uh, sorry, an electric or hybrid electric aircraft capable of flying that distance with significant passengers in the time frame that we're looking at. Battery technology just hasn't developed sufficiently, and we don't believe it will. So where electric and hybrid electric will play a part is in the short haul uh, regional uh, aircraft. Um, and that's, that, that, you know, that's not really a massive contributor to CO2. So uh, what we need is we need uh, something that is capable of being used on long haul wide body aircraft. And that's why the emphasis on SAP. Offsetting is very important. Offsetting, and you and I have spoken about this, has a bad reputation. And I think justifiably so when I look at some of the early offsetting schemes. So, uh, you know, what the industry is looking at in terms of offsetting is uh, principally built around the uh, ICAO, the United Nations program, which is called CORSIA, uh, Carbon Offsetting and Reduction uh, for International Aviation. Um, the criteria to comply with offsetting under the CORSIA rules very, very stringent, very, very tough. And in fact, most of the, I, I nearly say everything that you've seen in terms of offsetting to this point would not fulfill the criteria for Corsia. So the standards for the offsetting under Corsia is very, very high. And that's where I think we can be confident that these are credible offsets. Uh, they will be monitored, audited, and we'll have a clear um, understanding as to the impact of these uh, offsetting schemes compared to some of the schemes that we've seen today. So I think offsetting will play a part, uh, but the most significant part is uh, through uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And you, you touched on one thing. The, 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 the thing we find extremely frustrating from an industry point of view is uh, the inefficiency that's built into the air traffic control environment. Uh, it's well established that if we developed what's known as the single European sky in Europe, uh, it would save about 10% of the CO2 that's being produced by aviation in Europe. It's a massive saving. And what it means is instead of having 37 different uh, air traffic 
providers, you'd have a single unit that clearly has scale to cope with the uh, the whole of Europe. It'd be much more efficient. The, the skies over Europe, and my colleagues here will know this well, are very fragmented. You know, we're still flying uh, pathways through the sky that were established in the, the 40s and 50s, you know, when we were dependent on land-based navigation. Uh, you know, we don't require the airway structure as it's structured today, but because of the lack of political will to address this issue, we've made no progress on this uh, critical issue. But that could reduce CO2 from the air airline industry in Europe by 10% overnight. And no investment That's required, no technology required, it all exists. It just requires political will. And quite frankly, I, I think it's a, a scandal that the same politicians who are telling us about what we have to do uh, to ensure that we're um, more uh, efficient from an environmental point of view are not prepared to address uh, the political sensitivities around single European sky. It's very, very interesting. Thank you very much for all that. Well, yeah. Um, Ah, I, I promised I would. Um, we, we have a huge uh, offshore wind resource here in Ireland. Uh, wherever you might look, it could be 37 gigawatts, as written in the programme for government. There was a study by Airline Leasing Ireland and KPMG that identified 80, uh, 80 gigawatts of floating offshore uh, wind uh, in the Atlantic. Um, and, and they estimate that, that could account for something like 20 times the current demand for jet fuel. And given all our legacy and our history and the leasing and the position of Ireland in the uh, in, in, in the North Atlantic, uh, what do you see as the possibility for Ireland to get involved in this whole area around e-fuels and synthetic aviation fuels? Do you see as a I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, now, to produce a synthetic uh, fuel and e-fuel, you need renewable energy. Um, you know, and there isn't sufficient available today. Uh, but if you can identify opportunities to produce more sustainable in, uh, energy, that is in excess of what will be required by the economy as it is today. In other words, it's, an, it's not that you're going to substitute the sustainable uh, and renewable electricity that's available and give it to the airline industry. So if there's, if there's an excess that can be produced, and clearly Ireland has plenty of winds, then it's a, it's a massive opportunity to create uh, an industry that will benefit the environment, will create new jobs, will reduce your uh, dependence on importing energy. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, is a, a real win-win every way you look at it. So, and it's not just for Ireland, you know, there's other uh, pathways available for other countries. So sustainable aviation fuel app, app represents a fantastic opportunity for a lot of economies around the world who don't have the benefit of being able to produce oil from the ground. Uh, they can produce sustainable aviation fuel, sustainable fuel from multiple feedstocks. Uh, and uh, you know, this clearly is a massive opportunity for Ireland where we could produce more fuel that we require and actually start looking at exporting fuel. Uh, and the demand for uh, sustainable fuel is going to be uh, really significant in, in the years ahead. So, um, you know, if you were to look at an industry that could, uh, you know, improve your environmental footprint, uh, improve your, um, uh, your energy uh, security and create jobs, uh, you know, this is a, a real opportunity for Ireland. And the, and the airlines are talking with their checkbooks, they are actually creating yeah. a pull factor here as well. Yeah, well, that's exactly yeah, what's happening yeah, today. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, you know it, it's sad to see it, but, you know, all of the European airlines that have committed to targets for 2030 are actually buying their fuel in the US, which makes no sense. Uh, so because there isn't sufficient production in Europe, we're having to go to the US uh, and buy the sustainable aviation fuel there. Um, now, a, a number of the carriers that are buying the fuel there can use it because they have a transatlantic network, but some of them are actually going to have to ship it across from the US to Europe to use, which is total madness. You know, you're, you're actually increasing the carbon footprint of that fuel because you have to take into account the carbon used to yeah. actually ship the fuel from the production source to where it's going to be used. So, um, you know, I think Europe, uh, you know, I'm a proud Irishman, a proud European, but I think the policies being adopted by Europe uh, are, to my mind, not going to work and run counter to what we're seeing in the US. So Europe has taken a view that the way to progress this issue is to uh, impose um, restrictions and impose 
mandates to use the fuel. But mandating somebody to use something that isn't available is madness. And, and what's happening? So we, we have a situation in France today, for example, where fuel suppliers are required to produce a 1% blend. They have to have, in all the fuel that they produce to airlines, 1% of that has to be sustainable aviation fuel. There is no sustainable aviation fuel in France. So uh, they're not providing it, and they're being financially penalized as a result. These guys don't care. They're monopoly suppliers. So you know, their view is, penalize me all you like, because I'm just going to pass it on to my customer, who has no choice but to use the fuel that I'm making available to them. So you know, zero environmental benefit. Uh, and all it's doing is adding to the cost of aviation, which is clearly adding to the cost to the consumer. But there's no environmental benefit. So people who believe that you know, what we need to do is mandate the use, uh, I think have missed the debate that's going on where the airlines are saying, we want to use it. What we want is production. So instead of mandating the use of it, they need to incentivize the production of the sustainable fuel. Thank you.